Okay, good afternoon. Uh, this is room four, and the session is re Rethinking Warfare Economy Economies. Our speaker today is Miriam Pemberton, a research fellow from the Institute for Policy Studies. All right, my turn. Thank you very much. Um, so um, I'm here to uh, talk a bit about the book that I have um, done. It's called Six Stops on the National Security Tour, Rethinking Warfare Economies. I'm going to, I'm going to take it back, oh, yeah. but I want you to like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so I'm going to explain why I did this book uh, the way that I did. And to do that, I'm going to refer to one chart. I'm old school, and so I didn't do slides. I did a chart and I think you can see it there. Not that you can really uh, read what's in it, but um, you can basically see um, this uh, mountain range um, heading ever upwards. And um, so let's see, over here on the left, am I doing this right? No, okay, okay, well, then I gotta, then I gotta talk about it. So okay. here we go, how about that? Okay. There you go. There. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, so way over on the right um, is uh, World War II. So this is the trajectory of U.S. military spending since World War II. Um, and as you can see, th these there are these you know peaks, um, but they they do. They, when the when the peak comes down, and the first peak is of course the Korean War, uh, the second peak is um, the uh, the Vietnam War, and then we have the Reagan uh, military buildup uh, during the Cold War, and then finally uh, over on the left we have the highest peak, which is um, uh, the uh, Iraq and Afghanistan wars when we had two hundred thousand troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so uh, we had we were spending more money than at any time since World War II. Um, and there was a headline in Politico that says that the Biden defense budget is gonna be higher than any time in history. So uh, they weren't thinking about World War II, so we were spending more money then, um, but also they were talking about nominal terms that is not in, uh, adjusted for inflation. And if you adjust for inflation, um, <clears throat> we are not quite back up to that, uh, uh, that, that peak over on the left of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, but we're really close uh, when you adjust for inflation. Um, uh, and you know, if, we're, if uh, we go the way we are headed now, um, we, will, we will exceed that peak um, in the next few years. Um, so uh, I submit that uh, the reason that these peaks peak and then they never come back to where they were, they always go upward, even if we're adjusting for inflation. Um, and I submit that that has more to do um, with uh, political pressures than with national security needs. So um, I wanna look at one part of this chart, which is right there. Can you see it? That is um, the, uh, the trough, the largest trough in this, in this trajectory um, that occurred uh, when the Soviet Union imploded and um, uh, the defense budget uh, collapsed. It uh, was cut by about um, a third and procurement spending um, do I need to do this? I don't think I probably do. You can hear me. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, procurement spending was cut by two thirds and the military contractors were scrambling, obviously. Um, and the CEO of Lockheed Martin, the defense behemoth of, of all time, um, said in 1993 that he predicted that the growth for Lockheed Martin was gonna come from the civilian sector. He really said this, and that um, the, the trajectory for the company was um, that he predicted 
that Lockheed Martin would be about 55% in the defense market and 45% in the civilian market. Um, and obviously <laughs> that is not what, what uh, came to pass. Uh, Lockheed Martin is about 95% in the defense market now. Um, so, you know, we can think about why that happened. Um, we had uh, the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Colin Powell saying on the one hand, um, we are running out of enemies. But on the other hand, he said, we need to be building multiple layers of defense superiority to prevent any peer competitor to our sole superpower status from emerging. Um, and um, the, the book, which maybe, maybe you could pass around, um, um, looks at how the contractors um, made sure that this would happen, that the budget would, would start to rise again, um, making them uh, happy to stay in the defense market, most of them. So uh, we, we, know, we know about the revolving door. So that is um, people in the Pentagon sitting there across the table, negotiating deals with uh, the contractors. And um, they know that if they negotiate a sweet deal, then when they are ready to retire, they can just go right over and work for uh, the defense contractor and, and they will have their own sweet deal with the defense contractor. Um, and then as we know, um, some people who have been in defense contracting, uh, major uh, defense contractor lobbyists, um, sometimes can go and turn, turn around and uh, go to government, uh, in, including as the Secretary of Defense. The current Secretary of Defense um, uh, was you know, on the board of one of the major contractors, uh, one of his predecessors, Mark Esper. This happens all the time, you probably, um, you've probably uh, seen you know, many examples of that. So that's the revolving door. Then we have, of course, campaign contributions that are targeted to um, the uh, chairs of the key committees that have jurisdiction over defense spending. That is <clears throat> the House and Senate Armed Services Committees and uh, the Defense Subcommittee of uh, the Appropriations Committee. Um, those those are the members who are targeted for obvious reasons um, with uh, extraordinary uh, campaign contributions. But I submit that the most po potent strategy that the defense contractors used to turn around this decline in uh, military spending after the Cold War and sending it to its uh, current heights eventually um, was the strategy which they had used before, but they really intensified it in the post-Cold War period. And that is spreading contracts um, in as many jurisdictions, as many um, uh, parts of the country as possible. Um, so <clears throat> if you imagine a, a map of the United States, uh, imagine that map, and then you put stars in only four states, that is Hawaii, Alaska, Nebraska, and Wyoming. These are the only four states that the most expensive largest weapon system ever conceived, which is the F-35 fighter jet. Um, these are the only states where it is not being built, where there, where there, where there are no contracts for the F-35. So clearly this is uh, not, you know, um, a, a recipe for, um, for industrial efficiency to have contracts all over uh, for this one weapon system. Um, but it is a, a very good recipe for political protection. So anytime the F-35 is, is threatened, um, uh, you know, there is this hue and cry about the jobs that are gonna be lost if that happens. Um, so um, I decided to go and I've been working in this field for decades, um, but I decided to go and explore some of this spread of contracts 
um, around the country. So for example, uh, actually it was a week um, before the country totally shut down. So it was the last week I could possibly have gone out to Los Alamos to look at the nuclear weapons um, complex, the, 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 um, the origin and the, you know, the main uh, laboratory um, doing nuclear weapons research. And uh, also now they're uh, sort of against their will getting heavily into production of nuclear weapons. <clears throat> then I went to um, uh, an air base north of uh, Los Angeles. This is this air base has three of the big five prime contractors sharing space right on this one air base. That's Lockheed, Northrop Grumman, and Boeing. Um, uh, and and uh, oddly, also sharing space there um, is a Japanese con company making light rail cars for Los Angeles. So sort of one little indicator of what else they might be doing out there um, besides uh, making things like the B-21 bomber um, and hypersonic weapons to, to, to put onto the F-35 and so on. I also went to um, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, uh, the, sitting in the poorest quadrant of one of the poorest states in the United States. <clears throat> this is where um, the US during World War II built much of the um, uh, much of its chemical weapons stockpiles. They never used these weapons, but um, they, you know, they were afraid that, you know, if the Germans did, then you know, we would need our own designs. And so um, so that became sort of an economic mainstay for Pine Bluff, Arkansas, when there were there was just about nothing else there, just you know, managing all these stockpiles. But then came uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention, which um, mandated the destruction of all of our chemical weapons stockpile. Um, and so then the question was, this was in the early 90s. And so Pine Bluff has been sort of struggling ever since to figure out um, you know, what else it can build an economy around. And really what they're doing is just clinging to the remnants of that, of that base as their best idea. Next to this base, it was very interesting. Um, I was driving along uh, through these, you know, scrub pine forests and a lot of trailers, and I turned the corner, and there it was sort of like Oz, you know, coming up in front of me, which was the laboratory which they, where the U.S. developed all of its chemical weapons uh, stockpile. Uh, it, they did all the research, you know, which then, you know, turned into these weapons. And um, then oddly, Richard Nixon uh, decided that this laboratory, at about the time of the Chemical Weapons Convention, decided uh, we don't need to be doing this anymore. So right out there in these scrub pine woods is the only uh, 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 FDA, Food and Drug Administration, laboratory uh, outside of Washington, D.C. doing research on, you know, <clears throat> sort of what are the chemical uh, chemicals in our environment that are maybe cancer causing and all sorts of other uh, research projects. So, you know, as I was doing all these travels, I was looking for, you know, what else could these communities um, do besides being completely dependent on uh, Pentagon spending? Um, and so here were a few of the examples of, of what I found. Um, but, you know, so alternative economic development toward what end? Uh, if we're not gonna be um, building ever more weapons in order to employ people, and by the way, we could get into um, how this argument that uh, there are all these jobs dependent on these weapons, um, has some real caveats that need to be attached to it. So we could get into that if you, if you wanted. Um, but back to, you know, if we're not gonna be building, if we're not gonna be focusing most of our industrial policy on our prowess building the most sophisticated weapon systems and more of them than anybody else, what are we gonna do? 
So when he was vice president, uh, Joe Biden uh, went to the Pentagon and asked them, what is the greatest uh, security threat that we are facing? And he said, you know what they told me? It was climate change. Uh, the, it's the greatest concern for war and disruption short of a nuclear exchange. So, you know, the military itself says climate change um, is an urgent and growing threat to national security and it's gonna be accelerating. So as the US is trying to encircle China um, and sort of intimidate it um, and sort of neutralize it, you know, both China and the United States, month by month, year by year, are going to be having to deal with the consequences of climate, uh, you know, the growing catastrophe and their militaries are gonna to have to be focused on that. So. You know, I submit uh, we we do not have any more time to waste. Uh, we really need to be redirecting um, more of our industrial policy to building a, uh, a zero emission economy. Um, and one question is, can military industry uh, be redirected toward that challenge? Um, you know, can swords be converted into plowshares? Um, ones that will be useful tools in the effort to prevent climate catastrophe? And the answer is um, yes. Um, I did find a, a case that is outlined in the book. Um, uh, it's from Binghamton, New York, where um, it started out as Lockheed and then they sold their operations to um, another major contractor, BAE Systems. Um, and uh, after the, the Cold War, um, Lockheed told its engineers, you know, look around for what we, else we might be able to do in the civilian sector. And they came up with, um, they, they figured out how to adapt the hydraulic system they were building for this fighter jet and, and adapt it to build a hybrid electric bus. And these, and th there were lots of problems with doing that. Um, mostly, uh, you know, swords into plowshares work has uh, failed when military contractors just think, okay, I can use military production processes um, and just use them to build civilian products. And that, you know, simply does not work. You really have to think about how your processes have to change for this other sector of the economy to, to make any sense. Um, but these buses are, there are thousands of them. They are on the streets of New York City, Tokyo, um, London, and so on. They're, they're, they're all over. And now that they, now they have been um, adapted for all electric uh, vehicles. So, you know, it's possible for military producers to be useful to this challenge, um, but it's really hard to find cases where they have. This, this case was, um, was not, uh, uh, you know, I had a hard time finding, finding this case. Um, and the reason is, you know, when the military budget is rising, you know, nobody wants to try anything else because it's, you know, it's not easy and it's complicated. And, uh, the finance is much more uncertain. And, um, you know, so they, for the most part, they don't do it. Um, so uh, these cases will be marginal. There, there will be few and far between um, without a major shift in our industrial policy. So including R&D funds, you know, the special incentives that military contractors have, the um, uh, you know, regulation policy um, plus government programs to overcome the barriers to such a industrial transition. So question is, um, is there a model for this? Um, and I would say that there is. Uh, the best model for this kind of transition took place in California. Um, it at, uh, you know, after the Cold War, so uh, the aerospace industry in Southern California was decimated um, and the state came up with a plan to connect uh, the state's most stringent 
emissions regulations in the country um, to deal with their smog problem. Um, they connected that regulatory environment to an effort to uh, lift up the electric car industry in Southern California. Um, and, you know, so they, they did this, they developed a, um, you know, a prototype electric car, and they worked on retraining uh, the aerospace workers who had been laid off from the aerospace industry, retraining them to build these electric cars. Now, as we know, um, that transition did not really happen uh, for several reasons. The, the car industry was at that point not interested at all, which of course now they all are, and we hope it's not too late. Yeah. Um, uh, the contractors kind of gave lip service to this, um, but they weren't really serious about it. Um, and uh, there wasn't enough su financial support in, at the federal level um, the, the, you know, Clinton, uh, the night he was nominated for president, um, said we are going to, among others of his promises, uh, he said we are going to um, convert our economy from a defense giant to a domestic giant. Um, but most of those, so there, you know, there were substantial savings from the uh, defense budget cuts, um, but most of them went into deficit reduction, um, which sort of dissipated those funds throughout the economy and didn't provide what economists like to call demand pull. So uh, creating new markets in the civilian sector, um, you know, like building clean transportation infrastructure, for example, um, that uh, defense uh, contractors could, could move to. Um, so where are we now? Uh, as, as we know, um, military spending is, is soaring. Uh, we are now spending more than the next nine countries put together, most of them our allies. Um, and we are spending in, in inflation adjusted terms um, nearly as much as we have spent since World War II. Um, uh, and, you know, that, that endeavor uh, commands more than half of the budget that Congress votes on every year. Um, so meanwhile, we have this urgent need to uh, address climate catastrophe. Um, I would say the Biden administration has outlined a, a very good start on a green industrial policy. And remarkably, they got a lot of it through Congress. Um, but if you look at the proportions, um, the centerpiece of the climate uh, legislation that has that has passed and that is beginning to work on, you know, greening uh, our transportation, uh, housing, infrastructure, so on, um, is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and um, but when you compare that what what they are spending on um, the Inflation Reduction Act to what they're spending on the Pentagon. So the Pentagon is getting this year uh, $858 billion. That's for the nuclear weapons complex and uh, the, the conventional operations of the Pentagon. Um, and um, the, and the, the Inflation Reduction Act, about $37 billion a year for uh, over uh, 10 years. Um, so basically, uh, the climate uh, industrial policy is getting about 3% of what the Pentagon is, is getting. And um, I submit that this is wildly insufficient to the uh, magnitude of the problem, and we have to do better, and we can't wait. So I'd love to talk or, or um, you know, take questions or comments or, or whatever. I don't, yeah, we have yeah. a few minutes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Going the microphone. Okay. Uh, could you relate the Inflation uh, Reduction Act to what you're trying to achieve there? Uh, I mean, just to reduce inflation, if we reduce spending, then that would reduce inflation, right? So I don't understand the relationship of that act and the money that's being put out there. Where's that money going? 
Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I think, you know, the name is, uh, you know, a bit of a stretch and, um, uh, you know, a large portion of it is going to, um, you know, uh, creating uh, charging stations for charging stations for electric vehicles, uh, you know, extending broadband, um, uh, you know, creating clean water systems, um, uh, you know, mass transit, you know, all of the things that we do need to, um, you know, to prevent climate catastrophe. Um, I submit that if we don't do those things, uh, the costs are going to be absolutely astronomical, more than any, any society can bear. Um, so we have to do these things. So in the broadest sense, I'm sure the administration has a more targeted explanation for how this is all related to in reducing inflation. Um, but, um, you know, for me, uh, it's uh, spending that we absolutely have to make on economic grounds, human grounds, uh, you know, leaving a habitable planet for our grandchildren and, and so on. So, you know, I, I think your point is, you know, this is not, I mean, I don't know beyond what the Federal Reserve is doing, what we should be doing to uh, reduce inflation. It seems to be coming down, um, but, uh, you know, I, I think I take your point that, um, this is called an inflation reduction measure. I think uh, the climate spending in the package um, is broadly related to inflation, but it's also related to, um, to you know, try to prevent the worst of this catastrophe before, before it engulfs us all. I don't know that you agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, more questions. <laughs> once okay. um, thanks for your presentation. Um, I think you did a good job laying out how the by spreading out the contracts, the military, like the political problem becomes harder to solve. Um, and so on the contractor side, they're not going to likely pivot into clean energy stuff when they have these safe government contracts that are, you know, not as risky. Um, so do you have ideas on how we can solve the political problem or change the political dynamics to, you know, in, encourage that, um, that pivot? Um, well, maybe I'll go to, um, I was talking about the jobs argument because <clears throat> uh, the contractors, um, use the jobs argument as frequently as they use, you know, the national security argument. Um, so two points. One is a series of studies has looked at how um, uh, if you invest a billion dollars in military technology um, versus, you know, and what is the job result versus if you invest those funds in a variety of other things, including um, uh, education, healthcare, uh, clean transport, even, even tax cuts, tax cuts um, create more jobs than uh, does military technology. And um, so, you know, of course, if you throw, you know, the biggest portion of the budget at one thing, you're going to create a lot of jobs. Um, but, you know, what these studies show is that actually um, and you, if you invest in all these other things, you're going to create a lot more jobs um, than uh, than if you're investing in military technology. You know, there's various reasons for that, including military technology is very uh, capital intensive as opposed to labor intensive, and you know, a bunch of and the the leakage to foreign countries with the offsets. Um, uh, for production to happen overseas that don't create jobs here. You know, there's a bunch of reasons for that. Um, uh, but, you know, that message has to get out. Um, the other thing was, um, I, when I visited all these places, I kept um, finding 
that uh, these communities where there was all, you know, pouring in all this defense money um, uh, were, you know, not creating broad community prosperity. They were creating high paying jobs for a few people, but not, and that didn't tend to uh, spread out across um, the broader community. So for example, Los Alamos, um, the Los Alamos County right up at the top of the Mesa where they do all the weapons work um, is, is um, cited in Forbes magazines, you know, top per capita income locations in the country. It's like always in the top 10. Uh, the, the next county, Rio Arriba at the bottom of the Mesa is cited as one of the poorest counties in the United States. Um, so, you know, another example being um, uh, this air base I was talking about, at, about you know, north of, north of LA. Um, I interviewed the uh, economic development director there and he ruefully said that, you know, his community is called Palmdale. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it's pub the public perception of Palmdale um, is that he's fighting against is that this is a basket case. So um, then I looked at the top 60 most uh, Pentagon dependent counties in America. Um, and then I compared uh, those counties' um, poverty rates to the national average and found that uh, in more than about half the cases, um, the, uh, the um, poverty rate, um, uh, you know, where all this military money is going, um, exceeded the national poverty average. So there are a lot of holes to be put into this argument and, you know, the word just needs to get out about it. And that's part of why I'm doing this book. So. I'm sorry, we are out of time. Um, thank you so much. And that concludes this session. Thanks. So if anyone wants to buy the book, it's um, you just Google six stops on the national security tour and there it'll be. And uh, it's a little cheaper on Amazon than it is in with the publisher. <laughs> so thank you for coming. <clears throat>